welcome to the 7 Figure CEO Podcast, where we talk all things marketing strategies, business systems, personal development insights, and conduct interviews with successful CEOs and entrepreneurs. Learn the exact strategies on how 7 Figure CEOs market and scale their companies with your host, Chris Rodriguez. Welcome, everybody, to the Seven Figure CEO podcast. I have a very special guest with us today, Mrs. Lisa Wolf of Wolfpack Taekwondo. Welcome, ma'am. How are you? I'm doing great. Great to be on. Yeah, well, we really appreciate you taking some time here. Um, you know, I've had an opportunity not only to work together as, as Grow Pro with Grow Pro, but also with Maya. And we've seen, you know, uh, a lot of, we've gotten feedback from you, a lot of successful feedback. And I was like, we've got to get her on the podcast. We've got to hear, you know, where they started, where they're at now, and what decisions they made to, to get them where they're at. So, can you tell us a little bit about Wolfpack Taekwondo? How'd you guys, you know, get started? Uh, we actually got started teaching at a YMCA location. Um, we we had been helping with our instructor. He had the opportunity to to go into that space. Um, he didn't really want to do that, but we had been kind of helping him at his location. So he asked, asked us to do that. And so um, that was in 2007, January, uh, November 1st, 2007. Uh, so we started with not hardly any students, of course, because that was a completely new new place and new concept. And uh, in about two years, we had 70 students on a map space that probably was set for 20. And so okay. we would we had our secondary training facility, which meant if the weather was nice, we went outside. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. You were doing outside workouts even before COVID as That's a right, before they were workout cool. space. <laughs> That's great. So we, uh, that obviously wasn't working. Uh, my husband and I both were in IT. I was a database administrator and he was a computer programmer. Um, kind of getting fed up with that. It was just, you know, we were always on call, you know, dealing with uh, employees and, and things like that that just wasn't wasn't where we thought we wanted to be. And uh, so we thought we love doing doing this. We love seeing how it helps people. It helps children uh, become more confident and grow. Um, we've seen some adults that, that it's been a, a real lifesaver for them being in martial arts and just having a place that's consistent and looks out for them. And so that, that was kind of our motivator. So we uh, rented our first space in 2010. Um, it was 2,200 square feet and uh, that one we outgrew that one within about a year and a half and oh, then wow. it was we actually had an event that if the fire marshal had been called we probably would have been in a lot of trouble if you were inside you couldn't go outside and if you were outside you couldn't come in so oh wow you know that's and, one person that i have learned to get on your good side is the fire marshal you know you don't really necessarily think about that but that is somebody to have on your good side Yep. So here we are, 2010, we're in this brand new 2,200 square foot facility. You know, what, what's uh, brought us to, to where we're at now? Well, then, um, so we started an after school program during that time because we thought that that would be a, a good financial move for us. And uh, we had a lot of time because we were both full time at that point at the studio only. And um, so we moved over to in that same complex we were renting uh, they had a 5,000 square foot space, so we could add a second mat. We could increase the size of our after school program. Um, we stayed there for about a year and a half, and then this place came up for auction, and so we bought it and built out. So now we have our own building, 8,000 square foot, uh, three mats, um, a kitchen, a fitness room, offices. It's, it's probably more than we need, but sometimes it still doesn't feel like enough. <laughs> Sure. Well, that's amazing. Congratulations. I didn't Thank know you. that you guys own the building that you're in. I know for a lot of the Maya clients, um, you know, that is one of our goals is for them to be able to invest in that purchase of, of owning the building. Um, you know, what, what's your main style of martial arts? You said you had three different mat spaces. What are the different programs that you offer at, at Wolfpack Taekwondo? Um, so right now we only offer Taekwondo. So we, we do have a little bit of a Hapkido background, a little bit of jujitsu. So we kind of mingle that in a little bit. Um, 
what we typically do is we use our extra mat space. When the classes are large, we split off with another instructor so that, you know, if some students are going to be ready for testing, some students need extra work, things like that, and that gives us space to do that. Um, we had thought about, um, we're actually thinking now that maybe we need to schedule that second mat space more consistently. And then we use one of the mats primarily for our evaluation process. And that one, that was another big change for us. We used to, when students would come in, uh, we would just say, here's the class time. We would put them right in a class and then talk to them after a class. And that, some struggled with that. Some did really well with that. But the thing that really set it on fire for getting enrollment was one-on-one -on -one evaluation. And so doing that and that. a plan. Yeah, you know, so that's something that, you know, is one of the Maya systems, um, being able to do that one-on-one. -on -one. We do that at, at my academy as well. I don't believe there's anything that can build a better rapport with the parent, with the student, between the parent and, and the, you know, potential new sign-up than a one-on-one. -on -one. But I think, you know, what you just said is you actually have an additional space for it. And I think that's important to bring up that, you not everybody might be able to do those one on ones if they don't have the space or they're just going to limit uh, the time slots that they can do it. Right. If you only have yeah. one mat space or a very small school, you're only going to be able to do those like before classes or after classes. And also your instructor staff. Right. If you're right. a one one man or one woman person, do you really want to be doing all of those one on ones on top of teaching classes? But just like you have found great success with those one-on-ones, -on so have we in regards to the enrollment conversion, right? Not just getting them on a trial, but actually getting them on an enrolled exactly. in a 12 month, yeah, in a 12 month program. Awesome. So, you know, can you tell us a little bit about what you, Mrs. Wolf, does at Wolfpack Taekwondo? Oh my gosh. So I'm trying to narrow down what I do. <laughs> so, um, Sometimes I teach classes um, right down, down to the point of just a couple of weeks. Uh, I teach private lessons. I handle all the accounting. I do the marketing. Um, my husband does a lot of the flyers and, and things like that. He's taking over a lot of that, especially with our Facebook page and our website. And then um, if you have a question and you're here, I'm the person you usually come to. So I, I, I do it all. And sometimes some of it I do really well and some of it, Boy, I wish I had more help. <laughs> Fair enough. So you are the go-to in the school. Uh, you know, you had talked that you, you said a couple of the, you know, different responsibilities that you had. And, and one of them was marketing. And, you know, you said your husband was helping with a little bit of the, the social media Facebook pages. You know, what would you say has, you know, well, let's just start with this. What types of marketing do you guys do typically, you know, in your in your facility? And the only paid marketing we do is our social media through GrowPro. So uh, we do have a website and we offer a, a trial program on there. Typically, we post on Google My Business with an offer consistently, but the only paid advertising is, is on through Facebook and Instagram. Awesome. And, and what kind of results have you gotten, you know, utilizing the, the paid advertising? Uh, it's been pretty amazing. Uh, so I was looking at our fourth quarter for... Uh, last year because that really turned it off on for us and I've got my numbers so and this is all the leads that came in so third quarter we had 182 leads wow that led to a 48 appointment shows 52 new students and 58 trials wow so that's a, I mean that's a really solid quarter and what a great way to, to finish out 2021 right yeah that was amazing that last that last two weeks, I went through the, the sales pro process so much. I was forced. I was like, just please let me leave the office. I just, I don't want to talk to anybody else. I'm just. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think you could argue it's a good problem to have, right? I'm, I'm losing my voice because we're enrolling so many students. It was, um, it that was is great. great. Amazing share. So, you know, you know me, I love talking about digital marketing, but there's other forms of marketing as well. Are, are there any ones specific that have worked really well for you, whether it's referral marketing or partners in education, community-based, business-to-business? You know, what would you say, besides the digital paid advertising, what's really, you know, worked for you guys at Wolfpack? I would say the second best is referrals, and we run referral 
processes throughout the year. You know, we do um, the uh, belt in a bag for the Christmas holiday season. <clears throat> we give out uh, Valentine's for the for the kids to give out during Valentine's Day. Uh, we give out sometimes stuff through um, uh, where we get like little shamrocks. Uh, what it's March, whatever that St. Patrick's Day, and then yeah. we do <laughs> we do uh, we haven't had a lot of success with buddy buddy weeks and buddy classes, but just having them have something that they can hand to a friend and then they could come back on their own time has been been pretty good for us also. I love it. You know, I, I don't think, you know, a lot, a lot of times school owners will say like, yeah, we have a referral program, but it's more of like a reactive referral program as opposed to a proactive. And what you just described is, you know, really proactive with you guys doing the print marketing, handing it out to your students. And what I love is that you're using the holidays to disguise the repetition of the marketing, right? right? It's not just here's another VIP pass, bring your friend in, you're taking those holidays and using it to disguise the marketing, which is what I believe, you know, the most successful school owners do the same way, like as an instructor, right? We know when we're teaching kids martial arts, if we told the kid, oh, if you want to have a perfect sidekick, you've got to do it 10,000 times, you're going to get a lot of cancellations telling the kids that, right? But if we can disguise how they get those repetitions in with the sidekick, uh, you know, there's just going to be more success there. Awesome. So, you know, I, I want to kind of move uh, away from the marketing and more into just some kind of wisdom and advice. And uh, just so the listeners know, and, and I've mentioned this before on the podcast, I do send out some questions beforehand, but this one was not on the list. So I'm going to, I'm going to surprise Ooh. you here. Um, working together with a significant other. I've done it. My wife and I ran Gracie Pack all the way up until the, the birth of Cruz. And, and now we're blessed enough that she can be a stay at home mom. But, you know, how have, have you and your husband worked with with that dynamic? And you guys have been doing this for 14 years. It's not like you just got started. Any advice to couples that are running a business together? Because there are a lot of couples in the martial arts industry that, that are running their academies together. Any advice? Yeah, make sure that you know who is doing what. Because a lot of times we would talk about something and it'd be, that's a great idea, but it never got implemented because neither of us took the, the reins. We thought the other person was going to do something and kind of define what those roles are. And we're, we're, before we both, you know, we had, we would run two mats, we would teach separate classes. Or we would, you know, we would talk uh, uh, beforehand about who was going to teach what and we would hand off. Now we're both kind of pulling back into more of that owner and management style role. And it's um, right now, I'm in my office right now. We share this office. So when we go to the Maya event in February, we have two new offices being built because this is just too much togetherness. And uh, it's, it's hard for, you know, if he's working on something, I want to talk. If he's working on something... I, you know, I'm bringing a student in, and so we're going to move to the back of the space and then uh, kind of leave this open for our program director to kind of move in and, and handle the that stuff, because we do have program director training now. But yeah, defining roles and making sure you know who's doing what, and being extremely patient with one another the best that you can. <laughs> you know, I have very similar thoughts as well. Uh, Stephanie and I once shared an office. It lasted about 24 hours and then we figured out something different. And, and you're right, you know, when you're working together and then you live at home together, it's, it's nice to add that little bit of separation so you can miss each other, you know, a little bit. And I really love how you said define who's doing what. You know, prior to really having job descriptions outlined and these are the key responsibilities, what would end up happening for me is I would do something and my wife would say, oh, I already did that. And what a yeah. waste of like time and energy when you guys are both focusing on those things. Um, you know, one of the things that really helped us was just kind of drawing the line in the sand of, OK, these are my responsibilities. These are your responsibilities. And I think. One thing that can happen and, and, and is really awesome if this does happen is if one of your strengths is their weakness and vice versa, right? So we want to try to focus on what our, our strengths are. Um, you know, what would you, what would you say to somebody that is hesitant in 
you know, joining a networking group or hiring a mentor or hiring a coach, because I know you have one, right. um, you know, what, what was that, you know, experience like for you? And what would you say to somebody that, you know, is hesitant on, on pulling the trigger with that? Um, you know, I was that person that was hesitant. So I would say um, you need to get in, you need to do it. It for us, it was a, a serious game changer. So 2020, July, we had 21 students. We started, we built that to about 80 by November, which is when we first joined Maya Elite. And we did that 80 through that Maya Foundations program. So that was really because we joined that about that time because it was like, we've got to do something. This is, this is, we're either going to have to get into something that really helps our business grow and helps us understand better what we need to do, or it's time to call it quits. So Mm -hmm. that was just the big thing. So like I said, 21 students in, 80 by um, when we were talked about Maya Elite. So we finished the year with 183 students. So amazing. I mean, huge growth. Yeah. So, you know, let's, we, we didn't really, t- I try not to, to talk about COVID anymore because I just want to like, I want it to be in the rear view mirror, but I think that's important, right? You said July, 2020, you're sitting at 21 students. I'm imagining there, you know, was a loss there from COVID. You know, what did that look like? And, you know, what, what would you say was your biggest takeaway about getting through COVID and not just getting through it, but really thriving on the other side of it? Well, so our, the biggest issue with that was 90% of our student base was after school. And so Mm -hmm. that killed that after school program completely. And we were kind of unhappy with that program anyway. We were kind of, uh, we were just, we were tired of that concept. And so for us, it, it gave us, COVID was a great opportunity for us to switch gears with by a little bit by force but Mm -hmm. also gave us time to actually make decisions and decide what we wanted to do. So it, it, I think that for us, it was, it would turned out to be a good thing. So I, so are you, you're, are you, uh, do you guys still have the after school program? No, we dropped all of our summer camps, except for a couple of specialized camps uh, each summer. And then we completely dropped our after school program and are concentrating on our night only program. So with after school, gotcha. our maximum with our night and our after school program was 120. And that was a lot more hours, a lot more staff, a lot broader range of being responsible for other people's kids and for, for things that, that were a lot outside of what we really wanted to do. So I think that's a, a really great share. You know, there are a lot of schools out there that do really well with the after school program model. And I think it's just important to label it as what it is. It is a model and there is a different business model if you want to just focus on your evening program. Um, I started with having a just an evening martial arts program and I got shiny object syndrome of, you know, counting all the dollars in my head that that could occur with an after school program we built ours up ended up with four vans picking up from seven different schools i had a 12,000 square foot facility but at the end of the day my wife and i weren't happy no matter how much money it brought in the net profit because there's so many expenses with an right. after school program the gross revenue number looks really great but then you start subtracting all of the payroll and the van maintenance and the insurance and the stress of, like you said, being responsible for other people's mm-hmm. children for long periods of time. You know, I, I just kind of had a wake up moment for, for us. It just wasn't why we opened our school. And we wanted to get back to that root of why did we open up our school? Because we wanted to have an impact in our community through martial arts, not through an extracurricular activity that, you know, they're on campus yeah. for four hours, but we do martial arts for 30 minutes. Yeah, and that was when the I exact first same joined, situation. When I first joined, Maya, Mr. Metzger said, give me a year and you'll get rid of your after school program. And it took a little longer than a year. I held on. But uh, we no longer have it as well. And I do think that, you know, there is something to say about the stress levels that we have in our school. And at the end of the day, we don't want the business to own us. We want to own the business. And again, 
after school works and it can be a great business model for certain people, but it's not for everybody. And, you know, I, I don't think any of us really open up our martial arts school because we say, yeah, we want to, you know, drive the van to the elementary school and we want to do arts and crafts. And, you know, it's just not really why we open up our martial arts school. And I truly believe that if you have the right systems in place for your evening program, not only can you gross a higher revenue, your net profit's going to be higher and you're going to be much happier. And it sounds like you guys had a very similar experience. Yeah, that was almost exactly the same. I mean, right before COVID, two weeks before COVID, we spent $30,000 on a, a new to us, but 30 passenger, the whole, you know, oh, we're going to, we're going to really get into this. And it was like, okay, this is, so the, that was deciding that we were going to sell the, the, the tool that we had just bought. And at that time, it was, take a little bit of a loss on it that was kind of a hard decision but our yeah. happiness level and and definitely our um our financials are, are dramatically different so i love it great share so as we wrap you up here i have two more questions for you you know let's say we we go back to 2007 when you guys were, were teaching in the in the ymca or, or maybe even when you got into your that first 2200 square foot facility in 2010 if you were to start all over again What's one thing we could go back in a time machine? What's one thing you would have done differently? So I actually came up with three. So I'm going to go ahead and give you all. Okay, three. well, give me three then. I'll I'll take all three. I love it. Okay, so the most important thing is to keep stats and know your numbers because until I joined Maya, I couldn't have told you anything other than what I thought my active student count was, which was not actually my active student count. I was not good with my financial side numbers. I was not good with knowing my leads. I knew nothing. I was just like, woohoo, we've got an extra $500 this month, you know, or, oh crap, we're going to need a thousand dollars. You get a savings account we can pull that from, you know, totally clueless on that. Um, the second thing is it. get a mentor and get them early and fo follow what they tell you to do. Don't just pay them to talk to you. And then um, the third thing was outsource. Start start um, letting those tasks go that you aren't great at, that you don't love doing, and that somebody else has so much more skill than you. And so marketing for us was an important piece of that. And then the financial accounting is another piece of that. I love it. You know, uh, when I asked you, you know, what have been the results since, you know, working together and you knew the exact amount of leads, the exact amount of appointments, I always say math is the path. And being able to really utilize the numbers to make just smarter decisions is, is something that great school owners do. Um, hiring a mentor, I absolutely agree with that. And I love what you said is don't hire them just to talk, actually do what they say, right? Yeah. It's, it's usually not an issue of like lack of information. It's an issue of lack of execution. Um, so, so great shares. Mrs. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Any additional nuggets of wisdom or insight that you'd like to share with our listeners here? Uh, I think that's it. I, I made some notes. So I want to make sure that that covered the high points for folks. And that, that was everything I had listed. So. I love it. Well, I really appreciate your time today. Can't wait to share this episode with our followers. And thank you so much. Great. Great to talk to you.